Okay, so um, yeah, welcome everyone to the welcome meeting of digital engineering. Um, who here is from digital engineering? Everybody should raise their hand. Yeah. <laughs> and who here is uh, first semester digital engineering? And who is not? Okay, great. Yeah. So, um, yeah, welcome everyone. Welcome to Weimar. I guess many of you are new to Weimar, right? Uh, when did you arrive? Okay, two weeks. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, you probably know that. Uh, it's famous for many things, but also for the Bauhaus, of course, and Bauhaus legacy. Um, so we are in a very, very special place. It's well, the center of Germany, of course, but also uh, yeah, part of the uh, Bauhaus legacy where modern design, modern architecture were invented here at Bauhaus. So maybe you have had the chance to walk a bit around the city. There are also some Bauhaus tours where you can look at uh, well, some rooms in the university, some of the places where the, the Bauhaus School was, was founded, uh, which are now the main building on the central campus. So unfortunately, we are a little bit away from the central campus, um, <clears throat> which is very difficult for many students from Weimar, because usually in Weimar, you can reach everything in a few minutes. Um, but now we are so far outside, so people who, are, who have lived in, in Weimar for some time, they are not used to these... Uh, huge distances that we have to get out here. Um, so where are you all from? Small cities, big cities? Did anybody have to travel to university for more than half an hour where you went to university before? Who had to travel to university for more than half an hour in their first studies? Uh, okay. <laughs> ah, okay. Ah, okay. Yeah, so, well, that's... Uh, I think also when I studied, I, well... It was a bit more than maybe an hour to travel, so I would also rent a flight in the student dorms. Um, but of course, uh, so ah, yeah, so maybe I should introduce myself. So I'm Jan Oliver Ringert. I am one of the two digital engineering professors. So we have this huge group of professors from two faculties. Digital engineering is a joint uh, program between the faculty of civil engineering and the faculty of media, where we have the computer science people sitting. So of course, there are many professors that will will teach you, um, but there are two professors which are special because uh, <laughs> they are in charge of the digital engineering program and they are kind of between the two faculties. So um, the other one is uh, Professor Christian Koch. He's the professor for uh, who's, who's basically for digital engineering, but sitting in the uh, civil engineering faculty. And I'm the one for uh, digital engineering who's sitting in the media faculty. And, and we both, uh, yeah work on this uh, digital engineering program together. And we are the ones that uh, you should contact whenever there are any uh, yeah, questions about the program. So for example, this email address, I think right now it's, if you send an email to this, that's uh, Christian Koch and me who are reading this email. Uh, we're trying to maybe extend this group who reads these emails. Um, but yeah, right now, um, anything related to the studies, that's the email where you can reach us. Um, yeah, and now let's have a look more at the master program digital engineering. So the key idea is that we're, we are offering this interdisciplinary course for people from engineering backgrounds and people from computer science backgrounds. So you will see down here that the focus of the program is actually on civil engineering because that's the large engineering, uh, that we have in, in Weimar, but there might be people from all kinds of disciplines from engineering, so you can qualify with all other kind of engineering backgrounds and, uh, well, some kinds of uh, computer science backgrounds, of course. So, uh, yeah, which ones are you? Who is from an engineering background? Anybody from a computer science background? <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that that's the usual case, uh, but I think the majority still is from an engineering background. Uh, so what, what kinds of engineering? Maybe we'll just start from one side and you say which, which kind of engineering. We start front and then uh, we'll go to the second and third. So, yeah? I'm from civil engineering. Civil engineering? From civil engineering. I'm from mechanical engineering. Okay. I'm from mechanical engineering. <laughs> 
Okay. Ah, okay. <laughs> Okay, great. Yeah, so we have a, we have a nice mix, and then that's that's really a nice thing because well, the let's say the opportunities and the demands in the in the markets, not only in, in, in Germany where we have this industry 4.0 or 5.0 or whatever X point something, uh, which is some German initiative, uh, which is now well also known beyond Germany, of course. Um, but it's it's basically there's a lot of demand for people like you from an engineering background who also can look into the computer science aspects and for the computer science people who can also look into the engineering aspects just because well there's there's really few places where you can do it with purely one set of skills you often need the combination of skills to do uh, great stuff in, in industry uh, and of course also in, in research and academia um, so it's a two-year program and it's entirely in English. So all the lectures uh, that you would usually join, they will be in English. You have the opportunity to also take some language classes. So this way, it's not entirely in English because you can maybe learn uh, some German, some Italian or whatever. There's a, a lot of uh, offers by the uh, language center. So who already signed up for a language class? Ah, they they start a bit later. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and well, it's it's in English. And also, if you look at the number of international students at our university, it's not a small number. So I think it's comparatively um, comparatively large number of international students. So you will also find others uh, that communicate a lot in English and, and of course other languages. So I think we have. Uh, a bit more than 30% of our students are international students, which is yeah a nice community from all around the world. Um, and yeah, these are some professions and careers. Maybe some of you have already worked in some of these professions and, and careers. Uh, and and the, yeah, so there, there are some which are maybe more towards one uh, direction of the spectrum of engineering some are more to the spectrum of computer science and of course some are uh, exactly in the middle and that's the that's the nice thing that we can also uh, yeah send you out after this uh, to basically serve both communities and uh, do great things in the intersection of engineering and computer science um, we have some things which are somewhat unique about Bauhaus University is this uh, well project-based and research-led studies that we have also some projects where you can really do some your own kind of research um, and not all universities have this they are usually in uh, the I don't know third semester I think we will see some some overview very soon and their students basically they build uh, some some applications they do some research and uh, it's it's in groups, so I think it's a very nice thing to do, and people really yeah like those projects usually to create their own things. So it's not just like a lecture um, where somebody tells you what to do; you are actually free to do your own thing. Um, of course, with some guidance, because often these topics that are offered for the projects they relate to some of the research projects that the different uh, professorships do. In our university and today actually we have the project fair so it would be a little bit too early for you to go but if you just want to get some inspiration on what kind of projects are offered that's um, today at five in the Audimax um, and yeah who heard about it who's planning to go yeah so I mean you're free to go and free to listen but um, if you apply for a project right now you don't have the uh, yeah, formal requirements. So you have to pass your three foundation modules uh, that you got as a stipulation to be able to uh, join the projects. And some projects, they do have extra requirements. So some projects, they might say, well, you must have passed uh, the uh, module on introduction to machine learning, or you must have had a high mark in the software engineering module, something like that. They 
might require that. But um, yeah, you can already have a look. We will have, I think today they scheduled that it, uh, so each presentation of a project will be three minutes plus maybe one minute for questions. And the current schedule says that we start at five and end only after seven because there are so many projects that are offered. Um, yeah. So you can choose later which, whichever one you like. Um, this is an overview of the curriculum. Um, I'm not sure how deeply you looked into this. Um, who saw these blocks, engineering methods and computer science methods? Yeah, you saw them. How did you see them and when? Yeah, on the website, but they have only been on the website for a few weeks now, I think. Because what happened is that uh, every few years, I don't know, maybe every six years or so, uh, every program that is offered by a, I think, European university has to be accredited. Some people from other universities um, and some regulators, they will review your project, uh, your, your, your uh, program, and they will check whether everything is in order with the way you're teaching, with the content that you're teaching, uh, with the way that uh, you have the study requirements. So there are some uh, checks that they do. Is it possible to even do this program within the two years that we say it should be done? Uh, things like that. So we just had this round of re-accreditation because we have offered, I think, digital engineering now for, is it six years? Could be something like this. So uh, right now, when you start this semester, which all of you do, right? Uh, then you are studying according to the new regulations, which have some improvements over what we have learned that didn't work so well in the old regulations. So um, that's why some of these names have changed. Uh, so previously, there were like modeling methods or a, a modeling block, a simulation block, and a I think visualization and data science block. So um, there are a few changes. For example, you can't really simulate without having a model in engineering right and you can't really maybe well one of the purposes of modeling is simulation so there was always this uh, thing that students um requested whether this one module that they took could it be moved to the modeling block instead of the simulation block because in each you need a certain number of credits and uh, if you're very much interested in, in one topic then uh, you wanted to get as many of these topics into your uh, own curriculum as you could, right? So that's why you sometimes, or we had many students applying for, well, can I get this approved here and the other way around? And often the students were right. And uh, we gave them the opportunity to get basically uh, the things uh, approved in, in other blocks. So that's why we decided uh, it's just a lot of paperwork and we're going to join those blocks. And now these two blocks uh, are now called engineering methods. So that you don't have to ask all these uh, exceptions, because now the exceptions become the main rule, basically. Um, and then also maybe the uh, the things that you can do in the data science and, and visualization block, they are a little bit extended with more uh, modules that you can take. So that's why we decided to now call it computer science methods. So you have the engineering methods and the computer science methods, but uh, the the composition in terms of the workload and the credits they remained uh, the same. So that's why you have a little bit more, well, double the engineering over uh, the computer science methods. But some of the engineering methods, of course, they're a lot related to, uh, well, also computer science topics. It's just that they are maybe taught by the computer science people that formally stay in the faculty of civil engineering. So um, yeah, it doesn't mean that uh, you will have only very little computer science. It just means that uh, the labels are maybe more towards the engineering um, than the computer science. And then of course you have these electives. Uh, that's also something uh, I think not all universities have this huge freedom in terms of the electives. So the electives, they're basically things that you can take from any program that we teach here at Bauhaus University. Um, so you could even go to the arts faculty and take one of their lectures and take this as the credit for one of your electives. 
Uh, you see some smaller electives here. So the, the size roughly corresponds to the number of credits. So the normal blocks here, they are six credits. And then the small ones here, they're three credits. So one thing that is very, very common that people take as elective, that's a language class. So and language classes, I think they're usually three credits. So that's why you have some smaller blocks as electives. In total, you can uh, take 12 blocks of electives. So what also could happen is if you're really, really interested in um, the computer science area, you could take some of the computer science as an elective, right? That's, that's possible. Um, okay. And then <clears throat> in the first two semesters or the first year, you're uh, supposed to really take seriously your fundamentals, your stipulations that you got. So each person, uh, for each person that we accept to the program, we decide what is the uh, what are the three modules that they take as fundamentals or as stipulation. So uh, I guess most of the people with an engineering background, they will have uh, algorithms and data structures, maybe the software engineering and object-oriented programming. Yeah. So object-oriented programming, that's uh, Christian who's teaching this and the software engineering, that's me teaching this. Uh, but software engineering, that's actually next semester. Um, yeah, which is actually nice for you guys because then you can take the object-oriented uh, programming um, this semester. And then in software engineering, we're kind of on a more higher level of abstraction than the programming. So it's very good that you have the programming background then in the software engineering lecture. We have double intakes. So we, we also have an intake in the summer. Uh, but then those guys have the problem that they either want to take the... Um, well, software engineering right away, but then they're missing some of the programming background. So yeah, you did the right thing to come this semester and to join this intake. Um, okay, so, the, but this is also something really important. You should look at the timetables and check which ones of your stipulations can you take and you should take them as soon as possible. Uh, the reason why you should take them as soon as possible because there are some is it called research project or special project? Uh, I think in, yeah, probably research project. It's this, this kind of project, which is, I think, 12 credits. So it's uh, twice as much worth, twice as much as a regular module. So the regular modules, the credits, they, they're basically uh, composed of the time it takes for the lectures to sit in class and for the exercises that you might have to do and the time to study, the time to prepare uh, this ends up usually at the, as the six credits. And then for the research project, it's basically twice the amount of time expected. Um, does anybody have an idea how credits relate to work hours? Roughly. <laughs> uh, that's in, so the credit system is, is somewhat different. The credit system, one credit is roughly 30 hours of work over the semester. So basically uh, a six credit module uh, then gives you 180 hours that you should work. And um, you're expected to get roughly done uh, six modules per semester. If there are those six, uh, no, five. Uh, yeah, five of the six credit ones, uh, which would get you, uh, yeah, I don't know. Somebody calculate how many hours that is. Um, and then you can estimate that it's basically a full-time job, right? Uh, so your studies are like a full-time job. Okay. So, yeah, 900 hours. Good. So, yeah. <laughs> so that's, yeah, you have to do your own scheduling. I know that uh, some students, they take some part-time jobs. Um, just make sure that you, yeah, choose the time that you dedicate to, to everything wisely and, uh get to know how much time you really have to invest into, into the studies um, yeah, to make sure you get these things done. Uh, so for example, for the research project, you need to make sure that you clear the fundamentals. If, let's say in the first semester, you take the fundamentals, you take some electives, um, and you fail some exams, then you have the right to do the re-examination every following semester. So basically, if you fail something in the first semester, you have the right to uh, do the examination again in the second semester, which can then allow you to 
uh, take the research project in the third semester, right? Um, and the lectures are usually offered every two semesters. Um, so it's yeah a bit tricky if you want to do the lecture again to then get re-examined. So maybe check with the person teaching the lecture whether this will be possible based on the official study regulations. It's not. You have to re be re-examined the next semester. Um, yeah, so that's something to keep in mind and uh, check. But of course, yeah, just pass, right? Don't don't fail. Pass, get high grades, and uh, then you won't have any problems. Um, yeah, another important thing is this uh, master's module. That's basically well, maybe a bit far right now for you because it's at the end. It's basically concluding your studies um, with a master thesis, that's a research project you have to demonstrate that you can do your own, like a research led by your, your own um, as, as your master's module. There is this initial research, which should usually happen in the, and usually has to happen because uh, otherwise you won't manage in time, uh, in the semester before you start your uh, master's module. This initial research, I think it doesn't have any formal obligations with it. So you you could do this even if you don't have if you haven't passed all of your other modules. The master project itself to register really the start of the thesis for that you have to have passed all of the other ones, right? But the initial research you can do that. Um, maybe the first semester is a bit early. But uh, as soon as you find something really, really interesting, you can already start talking to the uh, people teaching it. This could be some of the uh, yeah, people doing their, their PhD to see if they have any, any topics in this area. You could already do a little bit of research uh, so that you can get this official initial research done uh, a little bit earlier. This initial research you could do as many times as you like. Um, but of course, it's some investment in, in terms of time, right? So choose wisely where you invest, that it's really an interesting uh, research topic. Um, and then this master's module, once you have committed to a topic and passed all the other uh, modules, received all your other credits, then um, that's basically, I think, 16 weeks uh, where you fully work on this, this project. Um, and that can only be repeated once. So initial research, you can look uh, in many areas. But the module here, um, if it doesn't work out, you only have one other chance. Uh, that, that's also important uh, in terms of the uh, other modules. Uh, do you know how many times you can fail? Three times, yeah. But then that's it, right? Uh, <laughs> so. Yeah, to so take those examinations seriously. Uh, it also depends uh, whether for some of the modules, check what actually requires you to take the examination because there are some modules where you have to do some homework to be admitted to the examination. But being admitted to the examination and actually registering for the examination are still two different things. So uh, I think last semester we had some people uh, being admitted to the examination, but not registering. And then in theory, we could send you away on the day of the exam because you haven't registered. Um, but yeah, but this is something you will, you will see how this works. And uh, another important thing is uh, if you notice that you won't make it for this one module and you think it's maybe better to concentrate on other modules, uh, there is some period where you can still deregister from an exam, and then you don't have to take it. Uh, although you might have the, uh, you might be admitted to the exam, so you have uh, now the right to take it. Uh, in many modules, you keep this right for the next semester or the next year as well. So sometimes uh, just be aware of these regulations: how to register, how to deregister, uh, to not accidentally fail some module because you signed up for the exam and then you don't go to the exam. Then it's a fail. So this would already be your first fail. And then uh, the second one, uh, yeah, would, would count again. So yeah, just be aware of these regulations. So I'm not sure how many people actually read those regulations, but it's 
a really good idea to do so now and then. Uh, maybe right now it's all a bit abstract, these regulations, and they are long texts, uh, but yeah, it's a good idea to read them. Is the link here somewhere? Yeah, well, the link is right here. It's a long link, uh, but I can show you on the website. So basically, uh, that's the digital engineering website. You probably saw that. And then uh, now you guys are the first ones with these study regulations. Um, ah, and they're not yet available in English. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. How is your German? B1. Who has more than B1? Who has less than B1? Ah, you have more? What's your? B2. Ah, great. Okay. Um, yeah, but they're working on the translation. So somebody internal on the university is still working on the, uh, on the translation. You can look at the previous regulations. There are just some terms which changed, like this uh, uh, engineering methods, computer science methods, um, which was simulation and, and modeling uh, versus, and, and uh, yeah, some other names, but uh, there were not many of those other changes. So if it's really yeah, important, then check out the one of the, uh, well, four years before. They have the English translations already. Uh, but yeah, we're working on the English translations also for uh, yeah, the new regulations. OK. Um, yeah, and then you have different timetables. Uh, so for you, this one would be the interesting timetable, yeah? There are still time regulations for 2007. So yeah, why why are those still there? The thing is, if students uh, started, let's say in 2018 or 2019 before the new regulations came in place, then they are still studying based on their regulations. So you basically study based on the regulations of when you started, which makes administration very very complicated. So. If you want to do, let's say, a master thesis or an initial research, you probably should tell people, I am like based on these study regulations or those study regulations. There are not many differences, but sometimes there are differences. So um, yeah, just uh, make sure whenever you have some emails that you send to professors or other people about teaching, tell them which intake you are, whether you're the, or which, which study regulation you, um, yeah, you study on. OK, and I have copied this. Uh, timetable here. Uh, well, this this was just an overview of the different blocks. So the fundamentals. That's basically three modules, uh, and everybody was told in this uh, letter uh, what are their three modules that they have to take as fundamentals. Then we have the engineering methods, uh, which are which basically this block here, uh, and then we have the Computer science methods, which is, well, yeah, this block here. Um, oh, there is some bullet point missing. So actually, uh, these ones are two different lectures. Uh, this lecture for methods for software engineering that starts tomorrow. I'm teaching that one. Uh, so I'm also teaching in the fundamentals. I teach the software engineering, but that's next semester. And then this semester, I'm teaching the four methods for software engineering uh, next semester I'll be teaching the generative software engineering um, yeah and those are also in this uh, computer science block um, yes the there are yes at this semester you could join the formal methods for software engineering um, yeah you will see based on the study content so basically in the Computer science, uh, the the lectures for computer science, the modules here, you just uh, find them on, um, I think, in Bison. Then you go to the Moodle site. You say you want to be registered. Then one of us has to say, yes, I admit you to this uh, thing. But that's not a formal thing. So this is just so that you can join the Moodle room and then see the lecture materials. Uh, so I haven't updated those yet. So in Moodle Room, it just says first meeting is tomorrow. Um, but uh, we'll put up the, the lecture materials. So you can 
uh, or what, what usually happens is that you have maybe 80 people joining in the beginning of the semester for your module. Uh, then you have maybe 60 people starting the homework uh, because that's what qualifies them for doing the exam. And then you maybe have, uh, at the end of the semester, maybe still 30 people really submitting all the homeworks. And then those people are usually the ones that also sign up for the exam. So um, it's, it's a bit different for the foundations because they are uh, the people that go there. They have to do them, right? All these uh, other ones, you can, well, look into the stuff that is being taught. You can see, do you like the people? Do you like the content? Um, and then you can decide whether you go through uh, to the formal registration. But then once you have um, registered and attempted, a module, you have to complete that module. So let's say you uh, register for the formal methods class, you somehow go with submitting all the homework, and then you uh, submit the final project. So there's no exam, there's a final project uh, in, in this one. Uh, so most of some, you need to check uh, how the final mark will be determined. Some of them, they take into account the stuff you do during the semester. Some of them, they only take the final exam. Some of them, they take the final project. Uh, so this depends on each module. So you can always check with the people teaching it, and they should tell you in the first session usually. Yeah? So uh, if I'm sure which course I'd like to choose, I think it's better not to choose this in my core module, just to attend it, and then I will decide that uh, I would like So the way that we do it in the computer science uh, is that uh, we like you, you can you can sign up on, on Bison, you can sign up on, on Moodle, and there's no uh, commitment that you did with that. So just by registering for the Moodle room and joining the lectures, you haven't committed to anything. You haven't committed that you're really doing this course. Even with submitting your homework, you haven't committed. Registering to the exam is the stuff that commits you, which happens during the, I don't know, uh, like four weeks before the end of the semester, four weeks before the end of teaching. That's when you have this exam registration uh, period. I'm not 100% sure how they do it in civil engineering because these are two different faculties, so they might do it differently. So for the computer science stuff, usually what happens is that um, in the beginning of the semester, we have tons of students in our Moodle rooms uh, and then sooner or later, we will see how many are really attending, right? So uh, for the computer science stuff, that's completely safe. For the civil engineering, I'm not 100% sure how the registration and commitment actually works. I'm not 100% sure if they do the same, do it the same way or if they say uh, registering is a commitment. But that's something that you maybe can ask the like uh, higher semester students. They should know. I should maybe ask them because uh, I should also know. But uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the problem with having two different faculties. Well, yeah, but uh, yeah. So basically, just usually you can look around and yeah, do a little bit of checking things out in the beginning. And uh, at some point, you won't manage to check everything out at the same level because at some point you have to uh, really work on the modules to to keep up with the content. So at some point, yeah, you will reduce the, the modules anyways. And then, but it's it's probably a good idea to look around a bit because many of the topics will be new. And yeah, so the first sessions, I think they are always the important ones. Um, it says on the timetable when the first sessions are. So that's the timetable here. Um, you see many things in parallel. So you can't take everything at once. But if you would take everything at once, you would be done in uh, one year instead of two years, right? Um, you you could if you wanted to, yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's eight because I forgot the bullets here. That's those are two different ones. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, you can do that. So for electives, you can uh, 
move any of these into the electives as well. So you could take five uh, of these computer science ones and get them uh, yeah, as part of your uh, curriculum. Um, you can, of course, take, I think, other ones if you want, but then I'm not sure whether they would appear in your final uh, grade sheet. Um, you Maybe you could. Uh, this is probably something the examination office has to say, because what they, uh, there are some programs where you get like a kind of a supplement sheet to your, uh, to your master's diploma, which says, these are the modules you took as part of these blocks, and they weigh in with those marks. Um, and then these are additional ones that you did with those marks, but uh, they will not be used for the calculation of the final grade. So I think for the final grade, it will only be those 120 credits. You might still be allowed to take the other ones, and then uh, they might still appear, um, but I'm not sure that there's a guarantee that they will appear. So that's something the examination office knows, and this might be different based on each uh, program. Yeah, the, that's basically the ones you have to take. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think it could also be an elective. Yeah. So if you wanted to take uh, more out of those, I think you can move. I think you can move everything into the electives that you want. But um, so let, let's say you started with uh, some computer science methods. Um, I don't know the first three, and. You just barely managed all of them. You have like a 4.0 in each of them. Uh, and then you do, I don't know, later because you have a bit of free time, you do the rest. And uh, they have like really, really high marks. Um, then I think they will be filling up the computer science methods in order that you took them. So not by highest mark. So this means that if you... Um, are done with the, let's say, the, the 18 credits, uh, then those first 18 credits that you got in the computer science methods are the ones that count for your final mark. So, yeah, then maybe you can still get very high marks in other ones and, and get them in the electives. But, uh, yeah, once you have finished those credits in those blocks, then that's the mark that you have. Um, yeah, so there's another thing also, of course, in the exams. Um, sometimes it happens that students don't get high marks in the exam, but they still pass. But then they got like a 3 point something or 4.0, which is the lowest mark you can get for passing. Um, and then they're very unhappy because, well, now that thing is stuck on your grade sheet. Um, if you know that that's going to happen while you sit in the exam, you can still cross out your exam. Uh, and say you want to fail, and then you just take it the next semester. So that's also something you could do. Just, um, yeah, but that's, I don't know, sometimes it's difficult to know where they're going to. Sorry? Uh, yeah, if you don't register, but the non, to not register, this is basically a few weeks before the exam, right? So if, if you already know then that you don't want to take this because you didn't understand anything during the lecture or something, then that's fine as well, yeah. But um, yeah, <laughs> sometimes we're marking exams and then we just think, why didn't this person just cross out everything and uh, just do it again next semester and get a much better grade, right? Um, but yeah, that's how it works. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, it's yes, there are exam periods. And these exam periods, they are uh, announced by the university. And they're usually right after teaching period. Um, and then there's always this text check with the faculty that is offering the module for their exam periods. Because uh, some, like I think, for example, in faculty of media, or at least in computer science, we usually say, well, the first week after teaching, we only put exams there in exceptional cases because we want to give students at least one week of no teaching time to prepare a bit. But I think that civil engineering doesn't do this. They put exams maybe in the first week already. Uh, but then, of course, computer science needs to extend the exam period 
uh, to one week after, because if we're not using the first week, then uh, we're using that. So that's that's why you need to always check at the uh, exam periods of the different faculties. Um, yeah. And um, if you ask the lecturers, when is our exam? Uh, they usually don't know. So what happens is that uh, sometime in the middle of the semester, we are being asked, which exams are you offering in the upcoming exam period? Then we tell the administration what exams we are offering. And then they try to find the rooms. They try to see how many people are we expecting to take the exam? How big does the room need to be? How many other exams are there to avoid collisions? So um, when you register for the exam, you know when it happens. But before that, probably even the lecturers that are teaching the course, they don't know when the exam happens because yeah, they might have some idea because it's not that different in every semester, but uh, it could still, if there are some collisions with other uh, lectures uh, taking exams at the same time, then it could still be moved. So we are also not in control of exactly when the exams are. That's like a central scheduled thing. Um, so yeah, and usually what I do as soon as I know the date, it's, uh, I put it on the Moodle page, uh, but before that, the only thing you can really count on is the official exam periods. So if you see those are the weeks, then uh, yeah, don't plan to do your vacation during those weeks because there might be exams during those weeks. Um, okay. Any other questions about this? So let's see. Yeah, that's the timetable. So basically, um, the first thing you should really look out for is the uh, stipulations that you have. So the fundamental modules that you really need to take in order to uh, make sure that you can progress. So there are some things like the um, this uh, the special research project or um, yes, yeah, some, I'm not sure if any, uh, I mean, some of the modules, they also have requirements that you have passed other modules. So, um, for the formal methods for software engineering, there's no requirement that you have passed the software engineering. It might be helpful if you have, but it's not a formal requirement. So you could take that, but there might be others that require uh, that you have passed maybe some, some other modules. So you should check that, whether you are able to take this uh, the modules that you're planning or whether they have these formal requirements. Um, Usually we don't have that many requirements, but sometimes stuff is based on each other and then there might be a requirement that you have passed one thing because otherwise half of the concepts that are used during the module, they might be very difficult for you to uh, yeah, catch up on. Okay, um, yeah, and there, there are some uh, language classes which are offered by the media faculty, so ac academic English, uh, that's actually different from the language center. I'm not 100% sure how you do with the registration, uh, but that's maybe something to figure out because I think those are quite uh, popular and then you need to register early for them. Uh, but right now, I'm not sure how to register for them. Um, hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, here it says, well, uh, register early for the language classes uh, that you can use as elective modules, right? So you can... Yeah. Yeah, that's a bit tricky, right? Because that's annoying if you show up and then nobody's there. Um, yeah. So, well, probably you have to risk it. <laughs> or check on the Moodle page. Uh, yeah. Maybe if you can get access to the Moodle page, then uh, it, it says it there. Uh, so I think for the for mine, it says it here. Yeah, maybe that's only the computer science methods where it says it, and then for the engineering methods, it doesn't say it all. For oh yeah, yeah. So sometimes there are these kind of collisions that are yeah impossible to 
sort out. Yeah, that's not so nice. Uh, actually, that this, uh, yeah, format it collides with the object oriented modeling. So yeah, sometimes we have those collisions. That's uh, unfortunate, but there are so many that it's it's almost impossible to. Uh, yeah, well, it is impossible to to get rid of all the collisions. I mean, you see, there are some even starting at seven thirty, which is a time which is not the most popular time, um, and then there are some which even yeah are at, at seven at night uh, to avoid further collisions. But it's yeah, it's not so easy to avoid collisions. Um, you also have to be when you when you look at your schedule, you have to look uh, at the places where it's actually taking place because it might mean that you have to travel from Marienstraße inside the city out here. And then, uh, so we had this last semester actually for my software engineering, which is a uh, stipulation for many students. Um, and this was with uh, something, I don't know, maybe building information modeling or something. In So basically, um, Christian Koch was teaching uh, maybe in, yeah, I think in, in this slot, then I was teaching in that slot, and then he was teaching again in that slot, and many students were taking both of our modules. So they basically were in Marienstraße, then they rushed to get here, and then they rushed back uh, to Marienstraße. That's right now a bit unfortunate because we are here outside of the city in uh, Schwanzigstraße, but um, I think rumors are that we're moving back in the summer. So basically, um yeah two semesters you might still have to go back and forth um and then we're hopefully back on the main campus so yeah that will make things uh, a lot easier um yeah and i know also that uh, usually when people decide what lectures do they take they consult other students who have taken those modules before, right? Um, which, yeah, could be a good idea, but sometimes it's a bit misleading because I had many students, uh, for example, for the generative development, uh, which I'm teaching in the previous semester, I was wondering a bit why I have, um, so the first semester I was teaching it, I had um, a lot of students. And then uh, last semester, the numbers were a bit down. Uh, so maybe, well, they, they were not terribly down in the end, but uh, I thought that I would have maybe at least the same number of students as before. And then it turns out that there was the rumor that the exam was so difficult and that so many people failed. Um, but I calculated and it was just uh, a bit less than a third failed, which is not so terrible. So uh, I, I'm teaching this software engineering and I took it over from another professor, and they're actually, uh, I think, 50% failed. Um, so I think a third is not so bad. <laughs> so don't be misled by uh, inofficial rumors and statistics. Uh, yeah. <laughs> OK. Yeah, so in most cases, you have. Um, a two-hour block of lectures and a two-hour block of uh, uh, exercises. And then sometimes you have also some uh, supported tutorials, which are maybe another two hours. So you might have six hours, but I think in most cases you have the four hours, which is two blocks then for, yeah, for the lectures. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yes, usually all of these, this is the week weekly schedule. So yeah, you probably have to go to both. You see here, one is the uh, lecture, and one is the exercise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, well, it always depends a bit. So there are some which have uh, exercises completely hand-on. And there are some which have exercises still in a lecture hall, but uh, yeah, maybe in, in pairs or a bit more interactive than a lecture. So uh, this really depends on the the, the person teaching. Uh, so for example, in the formal methods, um, we have the exercises still in a lecture hall, 
Uh, but then we're expecting people to bring their own laptops so that at least always two people can work on, on one machine. Um, because yeah, last year we had more people than we could fit in the computer lab. So that's why yeah, we couldn't really do the exercises in the computer lab. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but this uh, really always depends for uh, stuff like, well, very basic things like introduction to programming. Very likely uh, they will be in the lecture hall and in a computer lab. Uh, and some other things with more uh, where you are relying on labs um, than they probably are also in the lab. Um, yeah. And the assignment should be given So it, that's. Mm, everybody uses Moodle, but people use it differently. So, um, like, Moodle allows you to put up all the materials. Uh, some people do it, some people do it less. Uh, some people use the submissions and the marking and the feedback of Moodle. Some people might not. Uh, so it really depends on the person teaching the class. Uh, but yeah, I think most common, most commonly you have uh, the assignments available on Moodle and you can submit them there because you have to submit them usually by some deadline right, every week or every other week. Uh, so for example, yeah, in the fall methods, what we do is uh, the submission will then always be on Moodle. You have the worksheet on Moodle, um, and then you also submit on Moodle. Uh, in the software engineering, um, we usually use uh, either GitLab or GitHub, and then you do your work there, and you submit maybe a tag that you created to make sure that you didn't change the code afterwards, right? Uh, so, um, yeah, or you submit a zip file or something. It, it really depends. Um, and yeah, this, yeah, might really, uh, depend whether you can submit something handwritten or not. I'm not sure, uh, how now it's with mathematics. So when I was a student, which is, well, decades ago, uh, then we could submit handwritten stuff in the mathematics and then. It was expected. I don't know how it is right now, but they can still submit handwritten stuff. Um, yeah. So usually the source of information should be Moodle. If you don't find it on Moodle, ask the person teaching. So yeah. Usually those first meetings, they should clarify all those things. So uh, yeah, for example, yeah, in the, in the first meeting tomorrow, I'm going to introduce the formal methods lecture. What are we going to do? Uh, what is expected from the students? And then uh, sometimes the first exercise session is different from the first lecture session, where then uh, the exercises, so for example, in the software engineering module, which would be next semester, um, we're going to have uh, the introduction of the exercise in the first exercise session um, instead of the first lecture session. Uh, because those are, yeah, a little bit separated there. But again, it depends on the person teaching. But usually, if you go to the first meeting or get at least the slides of the first meeting, uh, then this should clarify uh, those things. And, and you can always also talk to the lecturers either at the end of the class or, uh, ah, that's one thing. So, of course, it's very easy to maybe find out our email address and then send us an email with a question. Um, very, very likely, if it's not clear to you, it's not clear to at least some others, right? So um, what I usually do is I put a forum on Google, so uh, on the Moodle thing. So in the Moodle room, you have a forum where you can post your question. And it's usually much better than writing an email. Because if you write an email, then it's only you who gets the response. And the other people who are unclear about this thing, they won't get the response. They won't be able to even know that somebody already has answered uh, this question. So the best thing is if there is a forum on Moodle dedicated for your questions, then try to use that. Um, yeah. And you can also subscribe to forums on Moodle. So. Um, I think I set them usually up so that everybody's auto-subscribed and has to uh, say that they don't want to receive the information about new questions and answers. Uh, 
Um, but yeah, sometimes it's not set up like this and then you have to uh, subscribe yourself so that you get an email every time somebody posts um, a new question or a new answer. Uh, yeah. Any other questions regarding the schedule? Yeah, so it's a bit tricky. Um, no, uh, I mean, uh, there are some. If if they have those collisions, sometimes those are um, let's say false positives. So what happens sometimes is that uh, some people put their um, exercises only every two weeks, and then they might alternate. So if if there's a, a collision, maybe with an exercise. It could be that uh, that collision doesn't really take place because both of the uh, people teaching, they do it every other week. Um, so always check with the people um, teaching whether they really teach every week, for is, uh, in particular the exercises. So lectures, usually they're not moved, but sometimes uh, exercises happen only every two weeks, and then it's fine to basically um, yeah go to that one only every second week, and if, if that fits with the schedule of the other, uh, it might work, but usually there are some collisions which probably you won't get uh, rid of, and this means then that this semester you can only take one of them. Um, you might take it, so the, uh, the way that these are repeated is usually every year, so that you might have um, the next one, uh, yeah, two semesters from now. Um, yeah, I think. I'm not sure if the next group is coming there. Um, okay. Yeah, some important things about... Uh, so, I mean, what you could do is you could also uh, look at the modules offered um, and then maybe look at some older timetables. I'm not sure if they are still available. But then already plan out the your whole program. You can try that, or at least the next two semesters. Uh, yeah, to see how many of your uh, specializations do you want to take. Um, but yeah, be open to change because your interest might also change, right? Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So there are some requirements for the master thesis uh, that you have English C1 and German A1. I think most of you have, anyways, German A1, right? Yeah. Um, okay. And then. Uh, yeah, for these language courses for, for English, uh, you need to register early, and I'm not 100% sure how. Um, you should expect something like 30 credits per semester. Some people, they take maybe, uh, yeah, not five modules, but six in a semester. That's probably still fine. Uh, but taking more than six, this might get really difficult. Um, and really look out for your stipulations, those mandatory fundamentals modules, that you try to clear them as soon as possible because the uh, project depends on them. Um, yeah, and the project must be completed before the master's module can be started. Uh, so usually you do that in the third semester of the project and then the master module in the fourth semester. Um, yeah. And this preparatory research module as we saw, you can uh, start it, well, as soon as you like, um, but probably it doesn't make sense to start it right now unless you really, really have a clear overview of uh, yeah, what research you want to do for your master thesis. Um, okay, any other questions right now? Can we submit the item set now for the initial table? Yeah, I'm not sure how this is. That's probably checked by the uh, examination 
office because they so what happens when you want to register for the master thesis you have to provide all the paperwork uh, that you have well passed all your modules and uh, that you have found a supervisor who supervises your thesis and then uh, they will check all these things and tell you if something is missing uh, so if you already have those language certificates you can probably uh, already submit them there and they can put it on your record so when you send them an email, uh, always make sure you put your matriculation number as well, because they usually look it up by matriculation number, which is uh, yeah a lot easier. Um, okay, any other questions? Yeah, I just wonder how. Uh, <laughs> um, which Moodle? Yeah. Maybe you have to offer um, there's an exam at the end of the class which gives you the certificate. So, yeah. <laughs> so, you also have to do the exam at the end of the class. Just attending is not enough. And sometimes those are separate, I think. Uh, so, it's again that you have to register for the exam. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, I'll try to share this somehow. Um, <laughs> any other questions? Can we attend other German exams like Gothic? Apart from yeah, you can take, uh, so you in, in the electives, you could basically, if you wanted to, you could fill those uh, 12 credits in electives with uh, just German classes, if you want to, but that's very, very rare. Uh, yeah. But actually for, um, yeah, for jobs and internships in some places in Germany, it is still, yeah, expected that the intern speaks German, right? So not in all the places. Uh, and yeah, I just had a, a meeting with a, a student who has a, a master thesis in a company in Bavaria. And I don't know how much you know about Bavaria, but um, they speak a slightly different German. So, um, and they were holding this, this meeting with the, the student in German. The student has, I'm, I'm not sure which level, maybe B2 uh, German, but uh, Bavarian German is, is very different. And afterwards I had to translate to her what... Uh, <laughs> What they actually said, uh, yeah. But that's um, what you will learn here is the like the normal German, not the Bavarian German. I'm not sure how you learn that. Uh, maybe you have to be born there. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, you basically need supervisors from the university so uh and the, the first supervisor usually needs to be a uh, professor from the program so somebody from digital engineering this could be in civil engineering could be in computer science uh they can be the first uh the second in theory could be somebody from industry but this has to be approved by the uh examination committee which means that you would have to apply for this exception so what usually happens is that even if you do your thesis in industry, uh, the two examiners will be from this university. Uh, and they might, so sometimes companies, they say, oh, here's a master thesis for you. And in this master thesis, you will do these things. Um, and then some students come to me or to other professors and they say, well, I, I have this great master thesis opportunity. This is what I'm going to do in my master thesis. And then we look at this and we say, well, this is not going to be considered a master thesis for our program because there's no research aspect. Uh, maybe the company wants a cheap intern who configures some systems, some machines or something, right? So um, then for our universities would not really qualify as a master thesis. Um, so doing a master thesis in industry means you still have to find a supervisor and you have to be a bit careful with finding a supervisor. So for example, sending an email to all the professors where you say, oh, I really like your courses. Do you want to supervise my master thesis with this company? Very likely you're not going to get a single response. Um, if you write to someone, maybe uh, you heard some of the modules. Better you heard more than one. And then it's better you say exactly what part you were particularly interested in or what part of those modules you think might be relevant for this master thesis, right? Because um, just sending it to every single professor to just find a supervisor, 
to supervise this thing that somebody thought would be good to hire a student for, uh, yeah, that's likely not yeah, going to work that well. If you have um, a supervisor who's really interested in a particular topic and a company that is open to doing a bit more work and allowing the student to do also those research aspects, then this could be a good fit. So I'm also supervising some projects which are with a company, uh, but then this also requires for me to be in quite a few meetings with this company. And it also requires for the company to send somebody to these meetings, even if they're just online, uh, to spend their time and talk to me and the student about the research aspects, right? Which not every company wants to do. Some companies, they just want cheap labor, right? Uh, so you have to be careful with those uh, topics. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it's possible. Um, some people, they don't do it at all. Because, um, yeah, what could happen is that in the end, uh, the student maybe only does 30% of what would be required for a research project in the company because a lot of the stuff they do is not relevant for the, the research part. Then the student still has to do another semester here, right? So the student spends a semester at the company uh, getting maybe only 30% of what is stuff relevant for the thesis and then you do the other 70% in another semester. So it also extends your studies. Uh, and in the worst case, your project is based on resources from the company that you no longer have access to. So, for example, they have some, uh, it's some company in the automotive industry. They have some very fancy embedded AI system that we don't have in this university. Then you will no longer be able to do any experiments with that if the time in the company is over. Uh, there are some companies which are very open and they uh, give the students um, some contracts that even cover the time for the initial research. So uh, there's a company right now where uh, one of our digital engineering students is, is doing uh, a master thesis and she's still doing the initial research and the company is already paying her. Uh, so this initial research, not every university does it. So it also depends on the flexibility of the company. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, sorry. Um, this can wait. Okay. Uh, any other questions right now? Can you take a semester break? You can take a uh, semester. Yeah, so I think in some constellations, if you want to do an internship, you need to do a like a, a Urlaub semester, like holiday semester, or I'm not sure what it's, what's the official English word for it. Uh, this is basically where then you cannot take any classes in the university. Um, but the important thing is that you register this, I think with the examination office, that you tell them that you need to be on this break, uh, because otherwise it will count as a regular semester in your studies, but very likely you're not getting any credits during that semester, uh, so then it's not good for your overall studies. But uh, having this uh, yeah, break semester, that's, that's usually fine. Uh, but there's also a limit of how many of those you can do uh, in terms of the student visas. So uh, like you can't do, I don't know, um, your first semester here, and then you disappear to some company where you work for another three semesters, and then you notice that your visa is expiring. So you need to apply for a new one, but then it might get very tricky to get um, any uh, justification of why you didn't progress with your studies, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if the Zoom is booked afterwards. Uh, then, yeah, thank you all for coming uh, and hopefully see you soon, either this semester or next semester. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, there's some. I'm not sure if this is actually uh, the current um, student assistance to help you arriving. Do any of these ring a bell to you? Then maybe it's from an old Excel sheet. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so just uh, if, if there's anything about the digital engineering, let uh, either me or Christian Koch know. Uh, yeah. What's the difference between exercise and seminar? 
Uh, ben? Ben? Habt ihr hier was? Uh, nein. Oh. Was? Oh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have uh, another meeting 11 minutes uh, ago. Sorry. Uh, uh, between seminar and exercise. So seminar is usually uh, a standalone thing, whereas exercise usually belongs to a lecture. But yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, I have another meeting right now at two, actually. Uh, yeah.